We now have a session with Professor Yong Zhao on the changes we need education post COVID-19. You received a couple pre-read papers from him earlier. Those were attached to the email from Rexel that were about his new book, Learners Without Borders. Reminder that after this session, we're gonna have a quick lunch break and our program with all of our speaker bios is on our website and also in the chat box. If you have questions for our speakers, please type them in the Q&A box, keep those coming. And this session right now is moderated by Milton Chen, one of our Asia Society Groundbreaker members and Executive Director Emeritus at George Lucas Education Foundation. Welcome, Milton, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Great to be with you all. Uh, thank you for attending this, this uh, virtual summit on education. Uh, and thank you, Asia Society, for organizing it. We were just saying in the, uh, in the green room how well organized this is as a, as a virtual event. This will be a, a very special talk with Professor Yong Zhao, uh, a friend and colleague. And uh, when I think about US-China education relations, uh, Yong Zhao, as you'll hear today, has a very special background and expertise for helping us understand uh, the changes we need as this uh, session is talked about uh, as the title, Education Post-COVID. Uh, just a little background about Yong Zhao. He uh, is a foundation distinguished professor at the University of Kansas. And before that was a, a professor at the University of Oregon. And I first met him when he was a professor of education and education technology at Michigan State University. Uh, he's also a professor at, uh, in Australia uh, at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education a very prolific author, uh, has written over 100 articles and 30 books, <laughs> uh, including his most recent book, which we'll talk about is Learners Without Borders, published by Corwin Press last year. Uh, borders in, the, in, in several meanings, which we can talk about. Uh, and importantly uh, for this conversation, uh, Yong Zhao is a great, as I said, ambassador between the US and China on education matters. Having grown up in China, in a rural area of Sichuan province, uh, having attended the uh, Sichuan Institute of Foreign Languages for college, uh, where he studied the teaching of English as a foreign language, having taught English in China, and then coming to the Uni United States for graduate study at the University of Illinois uh, and in Champaign-Urbana. So um, welcome, Jung, and I'm glad we can have this chance uh, to chat about your thoughts about the changes we need, education post-COVID. I know you've been talking about these changes for many years, but I'm certainly interested in your sense of how COVID is affecting the changes we need. Well, thanks, Milton. Uh, I am uh, all yours. Whatever you want me to do would be great. And it's so happy to be uh, with you and with the, again, the Asia Society uh, um, webinar. Actually, I was quite impressed with this. I was, uh, quite in, was quite interested in the conversation we heard part of it, which that conversation can carry on about US-China relationships, but we'll uh, add a little bit of that, you know. Do you yeah. want me to make a presentation, uh, talk about 15, 20 minutes? Is that what you are asking me to do? Or uh, what, do you have a different plan now? I think if you could address the, the topic of this session, the changes we need, education post COVID, uh, then I, of course, I'll follow up with some questions for you. And we're also encouraging uh, participants to put questions in the Q&A box and we'll certainly present those to Professor Zhao. Excellent. Well, thanks everybody. You know, uh, this this is a wonderful opportunity to do this. You can stay home and reach a lot of people. So uh, thanks for hanging out there. Uh, you know, there, there are several things I would like to really to talk about. In the first of all, uh, COVID has been so uncertain. I just want people to be reminded of that, how uncertain a world we are living in today. So uncertainty, is something we want our children to address. In the COVID that can come and go, even with vaccination, this pandemic refuses to be controlled. And uh, China just suddenly just popped up again, you know, in Jiangsu province, where Milton, your parents came from, you know, Jiangsu, Nanjing. And uh, that's shocking. And uh, of course, in Australia, if you watch Australia, Melbourne has been locked down for five times. You know, it's, uh, and now New South Wales, Sydney is uh, going through craziness and the US is, is surging. So I really want us to, to think about the future world as uncertainty. How do we help our children to deal with uncertainty? I think that has never been truly addressed. If you look at our education, we try to deliver a certain world to our children to say, 
we prepare you for the future. But there's really no future. The future is made by humanity and by pandemic and by, by technology, by weapons, by militaries, you know, by all the kind of things. So how do we educate our children to manage uncertainty for the better of humanity? I think that's really the number one lesson we need to think about that relates to the last session, US-China relationships or whatever. It all depends on what people we educate. How do we help our children to go beyond the basic reading and math to understand ourselves as global citizens, as members of a humanity that desires peace and prosperity for all people. I think that's not number one lesson. We, 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 we tend to forget that, you know, humanity is actually a lot more than the basic math and reading. Every country focus too much on math and reading. They drive you. If you cannot read by third grade, they put you in remediation, you know, all those kind of things, but humanity. The second thing is that is all the innovations we've created. Teachers, educators, policymakers, we actually have created quite a number of, inno number of innovations during the pandemic. You know, we responded to the pandemic fast, Within a week, we're offering remote learning. Then we are back in school, boom, we have to close it again. You know, that is actually quite amazing. Remote learning, I understand, you know, as an emergency measure was not necessarily created with the best thoughts, best design, best planning, but it has opened up something amazing. That is, we are, we were able to learn without students and teachers being together physically at the same time. Now that's a big lesson we need to learn. Learning can happen, we know that, but this time universally, everybody experienced that. Now that is amazing. You know, I, I understand remote learning did not deliver necessarily the best result, but actually let's think about face-to-face -face learning. You know, face-to-face you -face learning, there's a plenty of bad of that, you know, a plenty of bad of, you know, in-person learning. But also think about, we don't need to try remote learning really as an emergency measure. What if we stopped and planned a hybrid learning ecosystem where our children can learn both online and in person and appropriately, they may not have to be in school all five days a week. They may be there for three days a week and the other two days, you know, they'll be in a local community. They may be in a global academy. They may be learning with friends from China. Okay, speak of that, you know, maybe they're learning partners. So they don't have to be enemies in the future. You know, that, that's you know, another thing you know, I, I want to really encourage all educators and teachers to rethink you know, a different learning ecosystem where children can learn online and face-to-face. -face. A very nice combination. I know, Milton, you wrote a book about this many years ago, but, you know, and, uh, you know, when you were a retirer from the, you know, I think uh, the, uh, the foundation, you wrote a, you know, a great book about this. So that's what, you know, the George Lucas Education Foundation has done a lot, talk about technology-enabled learning that's before COVID. But today, after the universal experience of every student, every teacher, every school, we should be serious about that. And we require that. When I was talking about global learning, global competency, that's important. The third one was I want to share with you is that, you know, I wrote a book several years ago called uh, What Works May Hurt, Side Effects in Education. What works may hurt side effects in education. I was very, very shocked, you know, to find that there are so many educational outcomes, but they don't always go together. So you start very simple. For example, if you want to do better in math, you're spending more time on math, but then that same time cannot be spent on music. And then if you focus on reading, then you cannot necessarily have the same time on sports. You know, many of you may be interested in the international studies like PISA, the program for international student progress assessment, PISA. China's always number one, as you guys follow that. 
But you know how many hours Chinese students spend on those subjects? When you spend a lot of time on those subjects, you don't get to spend time on exploring the society and exploring nature, on building relationships, on develop uh, you know, creativity, develop all of those things. Then the second thing I've tracked is that Asian students always score very high, but their confidence is always lower than American students. You know, American students may say, well, I'm stupid, but I feel good. You know, th that's actually, it's, it's shocking. So I've tracked since 1960s, 1960s. You know, today people still talk about, oh, we are losing to China. We're losing to East Asia. Our education is getting worse, is in decline. But really from the data I've, seen, I've tracked since 1965, the first international mathematics study, American students, American education is not in decline. It's not getting worse. It has always been bad. It's been bad since the 1960s. But you look at then look at the other elements, confidence, curiosity, enjoyment. They always have a negative correlation. So a lot of times when you think about teaching today, when you're measuring students learning today, are they also enjoying this? Will they likely keep going with this? What do you think about short-term instructional outcomes and longer-term non-cognitive educational outcomes? So that's another thing I hope you know, COVID has reminded us. That's why I wrote an article called Build Back Better you know, about COVID. You know, we are now, the government, is worried about learning loss in math and reading. We want to give students testing. But when you think about, did our students learn to be more resilient? Did they learn to become more independent? Did they learn to manage their lessons better? Did they now have suddenly developed digital competence to manage technology? Have they developed new friendship and new ways of managing? This thing, you know, when we talk about returning, when you think about other educational outcomes, not just what you can measure at the end of a year. And the final point I was trying, you know, trying to make is this. You know, education reforms have been going on for decades. But if you look at the data, in this in the US, the NAEP data, the National you know, Education Assessment data called the Nation's Report Card, there's no improvement. There's no improvement in overall students' performance and there's no narrowing of the achievement gaps. Why is that? So I mean, if you track all the education reforms, there's one thing we missed, students. You know, adults, we change curriculum, we change teachers, we change assessments, but it has no impact. We need to change students. Because students need to be the owners of their own learning and students need to be partners of our education reforms. Students are natural born learners, students are intentional learners, and students are diverse learners. We need to put students as the learner who owns the education ecosystem. So overall, I think we have arrived at the time that we can help each and every student to become a global learner in a globalized context. And that is what I call learners without borders. That's what I wrote in this book. We have new models of learning. We have new models of teaching. Teachers, we do not have to teach everything. We need to help individual learners learn everything. Thank you. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, right? In those opening remarks, uh, I can't help but remember at one talk that you spoke of, you, you did say something similar about how nations, especially the U.S., is focused too much on math and reading. And this focus on math and reading incessantly over many decades of school reform at the expense of not valuing other areas of inquiry, such as you mentioned music and the arts, um, this is a time of the Olympics. Wouldn't it be great if students could be led to, they're so excited about sports. Could you read and do math about sports and the Olympics? In fact, there have been, you know, curricula developed by, um, by scientists and by um, English language uh, teachers about applying the Olympics to math and reading. 
but I also remember you said something about how every culture defines what it wants its kids to learn, that there has always been a common core for the educators here will know about the common core state standards. But you mentioned that when you were growing up as a young boy on a farm in Sichuan, that there was also a common core, what, what society had defined for the young children, that the skills they needed to learn to thrive in that society. So I, was my, I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on the common core in China when you were growing up. Well, when I was growing up, the common core was uh, what works in the village. There was, you know, the uh, chairman Ma was spreading primary schools, but that's not the main thing, you know. So, you know, I, you know, in the village was driving the water buffalo, climbing the trees to reach bird's nest and, and, uh, and pick up, you know, rice and sweet potatoes. And, and by the way, I was a horrible person you know, in the village. So that's where, you know, when my father sent me to school, I said, why don't you go to school without ruining my, my farm? And that was when how, how it happened, you know. I'm so happy my father sent me to school. And the school actually was in, in a little tiny village. We did not have textbooks, which as a one teacher who taught everybody, a bunch of kids get kind of, you know, got close in a, in a little room. That's kind of fun. So, so that common core, was uh, I was not good at that common core. So which is actually Milton brings up the big, uh, another thing I've been writing a lot about is how do you allow people who is not good at school common core to thrive in our schools? How every teacher can worry about the students who don't do well in a common core because we're diverse learners. People have different interests, have different innate and you know, experienced abilities. And how do we do that? Because everybody could have a future if we enable them to become great in their own unique ways without forcing them or overly forcing them about the common core. Because we can't be certain the common core actually works. You know, we just have to make a good guess. It might work, it may not, but you know, can we not be so faithful about our common core. Instead, we provide the experience for every student to thrive. You mentioned uh, the importance of valuing students. Um, you, you know, the phrase student-centered learning has been with us for, again, many decades, but you're talking about uh, a much more comprehensive view of how students can become partners in their own learning, as you mentioned, uh, even owners of their own learning. Are there places where you feel this is beginning to happen either before COVID or, or post COVID? Well, I mean, before it, it was happening, think about Sudbury Valley School, think about, you know, uh, Summer Hill School in England, you know, and all those democratic schools were happening sort of, you know, but now, you know, to these children are very different now. They can be exposed to God in unlimited really opportunities to learn, they can find someone to guide them, to tutor them. They can find how many lessons we have on YouTube, on Khan Academy. I mean, I'm just mentioning a few, not necessarily endorsing anyone, but also I've seen schools are doing this. Schools are really, uh, in Australia, you know, some of the schools I've visited, they have, uh, they bring a lot of technology, but also encourage students to run their education as an as enterprise. So in many ways, you, you, you actually documented this, Milton. You can share with them about, about the independent project in West Massachusetts. You've seen that happening. To these children can run their own education. They still need you know, adults, guidance, support, you know, creating a resource for them, but the possibility exists. Did you want to share with them what you, you talked about? I learned that from you many years ago when we were together in Australia about the independent project of the students who run their own high school? This is a project in Western Massachusetts uh, in the senior year and, and educators will be very familiar with that, that uh, common illness of high school seniors called senioritis when after, it usually takes place starting in January of senior year where seniors say, you know, I've done my college applications. Uh, I'm in my last semester of school and they kind of, you know, uh, uh, get very relaxed in terms of their learning. So uh, one day a senior was complaining to his mother about uh, not being very engaged in school. And his mother said, well, uh, don't just complain about it. Why don't you do something about it? So he went to the school principal and the administration and asked if he could organize his own learning for that semester as, and enlisted other high school seniors to do that. 
that became the Independence Project. I think it was a website that still exists. We'll have to check on that. The and they wrote Project. a book together too. The mother That's and right. the son wrote a book. Yeah, they wrote a good book, and we'll we'll put some of those resources in the chat. Um, he had a uh, he was fortunate to have the right kind of mother who knew a lot about education, <laughs> and so could help him think about how do you organize essentially project based learning. Um, to get more specific about the kind of curriculum uh, that Professor Zhao is talking about, where students have more ownership, it is project-based learning rather than textbook-based learning. So there they were able to organize projects. And it was amazing what students could do when they're given this kind of freedom and independence. I think for many you know, more traditional educators, it's quite threatening to give students more control, more authority over their own learning, when in fact, it's supposedly teachers who are supposed to be controlling the learning. So giving up control is a big part of it, but it is amazing and encouraging what students can do when they're given that kind of authority. Uh, I was uh, looking at uh, your, your book, uh, Learners Without Borders, and uh, you start off with a great example of, of students who are able to do this uh, from, was it Nepal? Nepal, yeah. Teenagers in Nepal with very few resources, but maybe you could tell that story about how armed with some access to the internet, they're able to organize their own learning. Yeah, thanks, Milton. I, I think that's actually what inspired me to write this book is, uh, you know, we are running a, a TV show. Uh, uh, Milton, I want to invite you sometime to be on that show. It's called Silver Lining for Learning. Because last year, I think uh, toward the end of February, I was in Philadelphia giving a talk at the National Association of Independent Schools. I was uh, joking to say, you know, what if schools got closed because of COVID for a year and a half? Remember that time China was the only country closed schools, you know, was not even a problem in the US. So that's why I was able to travel to Spain. But when I came back from Spain, the disease came. So I, I started inviting people, uh, you know, a bunch of them, I think Chris Didi out of Harvard and, uh, and Kurt Bunk of Indiana and Punya Mishra out of Arizona State. So we began to run a weekly TV show called a Silver Lining for Learning. You can search for that online. You can find a Silver Lining for Learning.org. We're on YouTube as well. So one of the episodes, we invited um, two teachers, I think three students, uh, young students, uh, 10, uh, 14 year olds from um, Nepal. And they have been taking MOOCs, you know, the massively open online courses. And so they are, the students, they were trying to take them for English in the beginning, and then they got interested in the content. So they, many of them have taken like 14, 16 uh, MOOCs, and they have expanded this learning from this remote, tiny, poor, mountainous country of Nepal. And that really shocked me. So, and then I was got me to reflect like in China, I still have relatives in China, in those tiny villages, why are the kids controlled? Because these kids cannot access, but they could access. So this is shock. So they, all of them could access, but then many teachers control that. Many teachers said, okay, you have to learn the content, the curriculum. That's what Milton was talking about. It's not project-based. It's not passion-driven. It is textbook, curriculum standards, or testing-driven. I think we truly have arrived at the time that we can liberate our students from that. I hope all educators hearing this is thinking about, I support students to find the resources, to find their passion and find their talent to do something amazing. We're all get, already getting some questions in the, in the Q&A box and I encourage uh, the participants to, to post more questions, but let's turn to some of them, make sure we get a response in, during the session. Um, there's a question from Chen Yang. Um, in balancing, in the balance of, of, of time on task, there's always a trade-off. What can a learner do best with limited time and energy? Where should they start? If you gave them more freedom and more authority over their own learning. Well, I don't think that question even exists. So, so to me, you know, okay. So you, you, uh, you know this, not all project-based uh, project learning works for all children. You got to, first of all, let the child pick the topic and 
come up with a question. That's a long process. Okay. So the child would give up after a while. That's okay. Give up because that's called Reno. You know, we learn resilience from our mistakes. But once a child is truly engaged, you cannot even take that child away. I've always wondered, remember though some kids like to play basketball. You know how hard it is for mothers to get them back in the house for dinner? You know, you know, they wouldn't go. So this engagement is, is you know, engagement is uh, individual. You know, as we call, you know, you enjoy the flow. You are creating, you are really realizing your talent. You are learning. And that moment, that process, is amazing. Very few students can experience that because we break them. We give them 45 minutes. We give them 30 minutes. Oh, you got 15 minutes to finish this question. You got 10 minutes to finish this question. I think we have redefined learning. Learning is truly strength-based, passion-driven, owned by students. That's not rush to judge a child's learning today or tomorrow. If you look to their schools, we destroy the flow. You know, we, we, we measure students to say, did you learn this? You know, I always joke about it. For example, have you memorized all the presidents of the US? If you haven't, go work harder. But really how important it is. If you, for that reason, by making them work harder to memorize the presidents, you might have destroyed their passion for history. We might have done that. So what I'm really interested in, is, in working on is to, can we create a space? You expose children, to a lot of opportunities, then they can pick and choose, you know, and then they will dive into that. You know, it's like all of us, when we are interested in something, we go through the torture. I'm not talking about fun. I'm talking about something interesting. We can be tortured. We can be, we torture ourselves, but we got really interested in that. Again, Milton, I want to, you know, reference what you were talking about. Look at Olympic games, all the athletes, I mean, really, the, the bike riders, you look at that, it's miserable, but they do it, you know, they're really, you know, for me, it's miserable, they do it. So, so I think that question should really focus on, are the students engaged? Are they always advancing themselves? But we want to make sure we're not getting TV kids. A lot of times our children are doing homework, like, like doing like watching TV, they're doing the same thing. It's not very meaningful. And so our children need to advance, to invite themselves to advance. You know, I think one of the uh, things that the Olympics tells us is that uh, there are a wide variety of sports and the, I guess the metaphor the analogy would be for an education, it would be as if all students must learn, you get two sports, it's either football or basketball, okay? Everybody has to play those sports and that's gonna be it. Uh, so more diversity in learning, more uh, choice over what you want to learn, just as you have a choice of sports, uh, that would help a lot. There was a question from Federico Moreno about um, online and hybrid education have not, has actually not worked for many students. We've heard reports that, of course, many students, especially younger students, having trouble with just uh, Zoom fatigue and staring at a screen. Um, so he says that we need to evolve, but how can we ensure that students are actually learning without testing them all the time? Well, I think that's the question. I was reading somewhere, uh, again, Milton from your Edutopia website. And there was an interesting uh, report saying that why some children thrive in remote learning? Why some children thrive? And, you, and the, again, that's your journal, you know, your old journal that, that then they track students, you know, some students completely get lost in in-person learning. Now this time they have their own control of time, of speed, of space, and some children get bullied on campus, but in remote learning, they're not. Some children are not very good, you know, uh, talking to teachers in, in person, but then they get more attention this way. So again, I'm not endorsing online learning, but what we need to do, uh, I think uh, from the person who asked the question is to evolve. We need to have spent a month, at least a week when we return to bring teachers and st students together to say, can we design something that actually works? Remember, remote learning by and large has not been designed or planned by many teachers. Now with the hybrid, how do we do the hybrid? You know how there are probably like 10, 20 different models of hybrid. And, and also, do we allow students to drive this? Or do we allow the teachers to drive? Yes, Zoom fatigue. 
If you put kids on, online for eight hours a day, that's definitely not a good idea. And we shouldn't do that. Actually, I was working with a school in Hong Kong, which has a very different way of doing remote learning. Give children a project, they go on, they hang out with their, uh, their small groups, and they're doing research. They are communicating with different, uh, uh, different people, trying to, re trying to manage schools online as if they were physical is one of the biggest mistakes. You know, we get kids up at you know, 6.30 and or 8.30, then we teach them all day. That's probably one of the biggest mistakes of, of online learning. So we can do a lot. Uh, it has not worked for some, has worked for some. And uh, so what we need to do is to reflect, to rethink. I really hate to say all the students lose the internet enabled devices, you know, that's we, we bought for them. I hate to say schools losing the technology resources we've created. I hate to say that our teachers losing this one time, I may not be one time, may come back again next year, right? but, but this rare opportunity of being online and at least have some experience to reflect on. There's a question from Mo uh, Lauscher. I believe that means that he or she is a teacher um, <laughs> asking about, well, uh, that, that's the last part about, uh, as you talked about becoming more independent, curious, and interculturally competent global learners. But perhaps you could address that about how do you begin to give students these kinds of global perspectives? Uh, certainly uh, something that the Asia Society cares a lot about and has some great content about. Well, that's my area I've uh, paid a lot of attention to. I think uh, first thing is that uh, I really think education should be run as a future society that our children truly want to maintain the prosperity and peace of, uh, of, of the planet. I think a lot of our political leaders, uh, they're misguided and they're misrepresenting the people. So what I would like to do, I would like to see educators in every country would like to build a global learning ecosystem. That is our students are participating, are interacting with each other. They're learning math, they're learning science, they're learning to make friends together. You know, it is actually easy to do that. You know, of course, again, this is not the first time. It's been done by many others. You know, we got a flat classroom that's been going on. You know, we used to have e the You know, all the technology is there. If every day, let's say we have a kindergarten. If your kindergartners come in, if they're able to say hi to students, even in another school, that's quite exciting. You know, actually it's quite exciting. I'm helping a, a Chinese school work with an Australian school, younger kids, really about five, six year olds, you know, they have the same time zone. They can say hi. Hey, what did you do? What did you eat? Kids are curious about others, you know. So projects like that, it can be done. It has been done. I think we need to bring a global experience. But that means really, you know, I would like to have a, a global society. I know this is kind of crazy. It's like before World War II, you know, UN, we try to run a global society. Everybody's happy together. But I have that dream, which we, which actually, by the way, is one of the reasons I do not like the Olympics. I like the sports, but I don't like the way they organize. It's nationalism. You know, it's this country against another country. Can you imagine, you know, the Olympics without countries? Just people and just athletes get together. That would be much more interesting and much more humanistic. And hopefully we'll see more of that as, as the Olympics moves forward. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a comment from, from my, I think it's pronounced Kayla or Kala about the Jefferson County Open School. There's a book about it, Lives of Passion, School of Hope by Rick Posner. So another good resource. I actually uh, have read that book. That was great. Rick gave me that book. It was really wonderful. Yeah. Is that Jefferson County in, um, there's several Jefferson counties. There's yeah, in Colorado. In Colorado, okay. Um, someone was asking in the, in the Q&A also about um, if they have to leave the session, are there ways in which, uh, we said this session will be recorded, but ways in which they can capture uh, all the different resources. Uh, so maybe Polarp or others can put that into the uh, chat or the Q&A about uh, this list of resources that we're generating. Great. Um, another question from Federico is how, how can we as educators motivate our superiors and district administrators to give us this kind of freedom to modify curriculum to fit individual students? 
Well, this is an extremely difficult time. As I was chatting with uh, some school leader yesterday, you know, there are many school leaders, uh, if they had been in this field for 20 years, they were eager to get out of it because of COVID. They were, so we have a lot of new superintendents, a lot of new school leaders. It's a challenging time, but also it's an exciting time. These people may not carry on that tradition and to do it, but however, the government is working against us because they want to have standard, standardized testing. They're pressuring school leaders to do that. So here's my kind of my advice. I've really two types of advice. One is to say, let's not rely on the system to change. Systems typically don't change. I used to say, okay, yeah, I'm hanging out with the Secretary of Education, the US Department of Education. I used to do a lot of government kind of things. And later on, I said, God, that has no impact. Basically, governments have government talks, you know, it's a, and systems don't lead. The systems keep track of, you know, stay the same. However, as the public, so the first advice is that we are public intellectuals. You know, we are intellectuals, we should always advocate for change. Systems change when public opinions change. If the newspaper, the reporting, if they began to endorse a different kind of story, even New York Times, The Atlantic, and Washington Post, many of the, this actually report bad stories of education. They were endorsing the role, reading has improved, the math, is, but they were forgetting something else. But if all the reporters began to report, generate, I think the public, publicly elected legislators will change. I think they will change. And when they change, the system might shift, but that's really falling in the public opinion. Second thing is ourselves. I believe every one of us has some place to change. No matter how, how much control there is, we still have space to change. In a very tightly controlled that you have to write a lesson plan every day to be reported, to be checked, like in the state of Chicago, you can still make some changes. You can pretend that you're writing those things, but you were actually looking at the child. So the lesson is that if you are there to help every child to grow, not to be a bureaucrat to implement the government mandates, I think we can do better. Is that every child grows in our own way. If you look at yourself, if what you're forcing them to learn does not make sense, make them hate you, that doesn't work. You know, that's how I kind of learned that lesson when I was sending my children to Chinese school on the weekend. They began to hate Chinese people, hate Chinese language. I said, no, that's really a bad lesson. Forget about that. You know, unlike Milton, now Milton loves Chinese, so he's learning Chinese. It's very different. So we got to rethink everybody can do something in their place. Uh, again, I wrote a book, and you can buy another book. It's called An Education Crisis is a Terrible Thing to Waste. I, we, I wrote that book before the COVID-19. So that's published by Teachers College Press. And where we documented changes made by teachers, by students, by principals, by education systems. So we actually documented this. So we, we, that book, I was going to name it called From Yes But to Yes And. That was the original title because everybody said, yeah, I agree with you, but we cannot do this. I said, well, there are people who are saying, yes, and I can do this. Yes, important to uh, get away from this either or thinking that uh, permeates education and perhaps uh, society. Uh, there's a question from Brian about, uh, I know it's a question that you uh, have thought a lot about, about creativity and fostering creativity and critical thinking. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about how teachers can begin to foster more of this, uh, certainly an important skill that's talked about in the workforce but uh, are there ways in which uh, students can be encouraged to be more creative? Well, thank you. I th that's a wonderful question. You know, I have been uh, following a lot on creativity, but really at a macro level. You know, first of all, as you probably know, in education, in psychology, that everybody is born creative, but that creativity can be applied in different areas. So this actually, I'll give you one example. You know, uh, I actually wrote an article recently called How Not to Kill Creativity is Not to Teach Creativity. Okay, so, so this is actually, Milton, you, you might know this. I've always said this. I said, when Chinese people ask me, how are Americans so creative? 
I said, first thing you need to know is Americans don't teach creativity any better than us. If you go to most American classrooms, they're as bad as Chinese classrooms. But I said, they are not as good or as effective in killing creativity as Amer Chinese. So don't kill it as effectively. You know, why did American education allow creativity to survive better? Because, you know, I, I, I use kind of two examples. Do you remember in every elementary school, we used to have something called um, talent shows. You know, American talent shows? In China, you don't get that. So Americans talent shows, everybody has some talent. You can't believe it. if you want to go say something, you have talent. It's called talent show. Now that allows everyone to feel good about themselves. And that may be force, but at least you allow people who think they have talent can be expressed. In China, you have kids actually truly have talent because they're pre-selected to perform, but you don't have the self-selecting talent shows. The second thing I think I learned is that from my, my son's first grade teacher, and she was really nice so we're so we're chatting she said you know i really believe kids are like a, like corn like popcorns some kind of you know a pop early and some pop late you know i was of course i joked with her i said well you know what what about the few who get burned and what well, other than the few who get burned everybody pops now that's amazing you have patience for children to grow that doesn't exist by the way however i think those things have disappeared from American education because of no child left behind, because of state standards testing, because of Obama's new ESSA. I think that we've lost all of that. Today, we don't have that kind of many talent shows. Today, we only value kids who is good at reading and math. I think now the big thing for all of us to think, education is whole life. It's not only what you teach, it is give them the opportunity to see more, to know more. Which, by the way, actually, I want to give another example. It was three years ago, I think it's a, a group of um, economists from, uh, I think, uh, Harvard and Stanford and London uh, School of uh, Economics. And so they did a report. They, they did a big data analysis. Who in the US invent, basically? So they try to look at the, all the patents filed in the US database and track back to all these children. So they discovered one thing, you know, what affects a person's inventiveness? It's basically exposure. So like in San Francisco, you got a lot more kids want to invent stuff. You go to Silicon Valley, if you don't invent, you feel shameful, right? You gotta to talk to people, you gotta, oh, I have this patent, I have this idea. But if you go to another city in the South, they probably don't have that. Kids with families, kids with the neighborhood who are inventive, they become more inventive, they get more patents. So that's again, it's really not about spending money on the individual you think they have talents, but rather create a broader environment when the talents grow. And I'm wondering as you describe where this is given um, time to grow, uh, a lot of this happens in, in the time outside of school are so much focus on, on what, how we can change schools themselves. But in fact, children have much more time outside of school. We have a very long summer vacation, <laughs> uh, made longer this year. Um, wondering about your thoughts about how the out of school time can be used. There's federal support for after school programs. Of course, uh, the US is very rich with uh, museums and science centers. Uh, sometimes it costs money. Uh, public libraries off, often offer classes, uh, creative classes for free for students, different times. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious about how you think that out of school time can also be used to encourage more creativity. Well, I think in Milton, uh, the out of uh, school time is probably what has saved many American kids you know, from creativity. Because in China, oh, by the way, many of you may just have seen the news, China has kind of shut down all the tutoring services, all the big companies you know, on the US stock market have been closed, all this. It is precisely they want the Chinese children to be more relaxed, to have more time to experience museums, art galleries, go to you know musicals, concert. You know, you know how American students do so many things that's not connected to schooling. 
In China, all the outside school, outside activities connected schooling and testing. So that's very amazing. So I mean, in America, you see parents kind of hanging out, take kids to a park. That's actually energizing. That's inventive. So in innovate creativity needs to be stimulated, needs to be inspired. But a lot of times schooling controls that. This is another reason action was, uh, I, when I wrote a book, again, 2009, my, one of my books is called Catching Up or Leading the Way, American Education in the Age of Globalization, where I talk about if we treat schools as a creativity killing mission, let's just take that. All schools kills creativity. That's, that's, that's for sure, actually. Now, if you spend more time in school, your creativity gets killed a lot more. And you probably have seen a lot of smart, creative people. They did not stay with school for long enough. They were actually doing something else. So uh, by the way, I'm not asking you guys to go back to close your schools. Okay. I'm just saying that this, you know, with this idea to say outside classroom, outside school activity is important, which by the way, I just want to add one more point. Under No Child Left Behind and ESSA, we have cut down a lot of a lot of important non-academic programs for poor children in the cities, in inner cities, because we want to increase our children's, again, math and writing. You remember George Bush actually turned what Bill Clinton's called 21st century learning centers into academic centers. I used to lead about 20 middle school computer clubhouses in Michigan in the 1990s. That's under Bill Clinton. Later on, when George Bush came along, you got to translate those centers into reading and math. And so they hired a lot of tutoring centers into reading and math. And we've lost a lot. And also in the inner cities, in order to close the achievement gap, we have widened the opportunity gap. A lot of poor families who don't have money to buy arts, to buy music outside school, they relied on school for those little activities. But well, in order to do math and reading, we're basically depriving a lot of our children from those areas of this opportunity out of outside school activities that might make them more creative, might inspire them to be take on creative actions. And we have a few minutes left and I encourage participants to post any final uh, questions in the Q&A box. But I want to turn to a topic uh, uh, about which you have a very special vantage point, and that is the US-China relationship. It came up in the two earlier sessions today, uh, comments from um, Ken Wilcox and from Gordon Chang from Stanford. Uh, you know, this is, you've lived through a, a lot of different phases of the US-China relationship, having grown up in China and then having uh, been a professor here in the US. Um, what are your thoughts about where this is now, uh, now that we're clearly in a competitive uh, relationship uh, between the US and China? And any thoughts you have about where that might be headed and how we as educators, people concerned about the education of our children uh, could actually do something to help make that a more positive relationship? Well, first of all, I really want to examine this. America, you know, America thrives on having enemies. Without enemies, you know, we, we don't seem to do well. You know, we used to have Soviet Union. That was a great, very powerful enemy. America get become innovative to do things. And I think U.S. needs some kind of enemy. And, but at the same time, you know, China is not necessarily doing great. You know, China has a lot of, a lot of problems in, in and of itself. You know, it's not as open. It's been closed uh, itself. So, but I think this process, hopefully, will not last for more than five years. That, that's my, my guess, you know. And, but it could last for 10 years. I, I don't know. So that's my, my wish is that... But I think that this is precisely the time for educators to be more engaged. I don't think that the two countries, you know, they can have, they can trade a lot of quarrels, they can have trade wars, they can have all kinds of things. But ultimately, we need the people to be connected. So I would agree with, with Ken Wilcox, you know, I, I think it's that people have to stay and the best people to stay connected are our children. And the best way to stay connected is through internet right now. If we don't have to travel there, we don't have to go anywhere, nobody can travel anyway. I think it's, so that's why I was really emphasizing the idea of building 
global projects. Maybe the Asia Society can lead that. Building global societies, build, you know, Milton Yuan I can teach a course from, for, for Asia Society, just to build a big projects. I mean, big projects, you know, for example, actually, I'm actually doing a big project uh, with the YEE education in China, and which is doing a project for me, it's called HIP, the Human Interdependence Project. I started that project uh, in the last May when the pandemic was getting worse, when people were blaming each other. So I, I said, okay, why don't we start a short course, an entrepreneurship course online? So we have students from our Colombia, Argentina, China, Australia, many countries participating. What children basically get in do is to create a product that demonstrates how human beings are interconnected. No matter where you are, how human demonstrate, you can find out, okay, God, you know, like in China, Chinese kids say, where did the elevator come from? And you can go to shopping mall. Or oh, a kid in Argentina say, God, where did this Chinese food come from? How, how are we interdependent? How we develop this? So I call that HIP. And then out of that project, we invite students from that project to become a hipster. You know, I can come up with better names, hipster. And hipsters, to do a service project. So they provide service to other kids. Like the US kids can tutor Chinese kids English and vice versa. Or they can work together on a math project. And then they earn some credit and hopefully schools would accept that service project. So maybe Asia Society, you guys can, can, can work on that because it, I'd like to have young children to really learn human beings cannot become better by killing other people. Human beings do not thrive better by simply blocking other people. There's no way you can do it. Eventually, we have to come back. We have to be together. And you know, today, Milton, we have more food, but there are people who are starving. And we have a lot more resources, but we're inventing weapons to kill each other. And I can I can really stand when countries to say, how many more weapons we have, how much more powerful we are than you. I don't know, I'm, I'm a kind of idealistic and a crazy guy. I'm kind of, in many ways, I'm more of an anarchist to say, individuals should govern themselves. Let's not kill each other, let's help each other. Let me see if I can fit in just a few more questions and comments from uh, Wen Lin uh, Su that uh, he agrees that uh, the reason why students take these extracurricular activities is because they have choice. That they're it's fun, it's interesting. They don't do it necessarily for contests or competitions, but when they do get involved with these activities, they feel more confident, they enjoy them and put in more time as you were suggesting. Um, I think we might have a time for a question uh, from Matt. Uh, why was there recent government response to undermining profitability of after-school tutoring companies in China? I don't know whether that's something you followed. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I follow that a lot. I was actually doing an interview with Ed Surge, you know, the, the Ed, Ed Tech Max, and we're just talking about that. Well, the, there are several reasons. And one is that uh, the companies have become really powerful. They dominate a lot of a lot of kids' time, and but then they, but not only dominating, their tutoring for me actually, this is my person, is of no value. They're basically preparing kids to do better on the test. Remember, so if you pay a hundred bucks or a thousand dollars, you're doing better testing, but everybody is getting extra tutoring. So still you have competition. That is no matter what you do, it has no real outcome, you know? And another, of course, there's so many foreign, foreign capital in these companies and the Chinese government does not want a lot of, you know, foreign influence on their students at this moment. And, and then also China has been battling excessive student academic burden for a long time. So this policy actually came out of a, re, uh, uh, a government policy is called a double reduction. They want to reduce school homework and they also reduce extra tutoring time. So this is the time to do it, but the way they're doing it is really serious. They are shutting them down and they just kind of, you can't do this stuff. And uh, I, I mean, I, I actually, I have, uh, I don't know how effective this can be in a few years, but this is happening right now. So that's the kind of reasons, you know, there are other reasons, you know, uh, you know, for example, you know, another reason is that they want schools to have more control of student learning. So schools now are given the right 
the schools have to offer after school programs for all children, which they did, but they were not allowed to do that. And now they are allowed back to do this again because parents have this need. I really like the idea of just fostering more global exchange. Uh, this idea of a more uh, internet-based communication between children uh, could start very early now that we have this wonderful tool. I think we can all remember back to a time when video conferencing was either non-existent or very expensive. Uh, but hopefully coming out of COVID, we'll see more of these sort of global exchanges. And certainly I know Asia Society through their education program is fostering a number of these sorts, sorts of projects and love to see more of that. Um, Young Zhao, thank you so much for joining us for this hour and presenting such interesting perspectives and your expertise from both countries and both cultures and both languages. Uh, but thank you for spending this time and you've given us a lot to think about and a list of resources that we can all continue to share. So with that, let me talk, toss it back to Margaret Connolly. Thank you, Professor Zhao and Milton Chen. You heard Professor Young Zhao just now. We need Milton to come teach a course for Asia Society on the Future Generation Project with lots of uh, internet-based exchanges in technology. We'll actually hear directly from our next generation of leaders and students during tomorrow's program, so stay tuned, especially in the morning. Thank you for that idea and for this discussion. It's prompted lots of interaction from the audience, and we love that. 